Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante with Wikibon.org, and this is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's production of IBM Pulse. We're here live at the MGM in Las Vegas. Uh, we've got two days of coverage. The Cube goes out, we extract the signal from the noise. Good friend Jason Buffington is here. He's an analyst with uh, ESG, a very well-known organization. His focus is on uh, backup and, and, and strategies around backup. Jason, welcome back to the Cube. It's good to see you again. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so, um, Pulse, you know, good show, 10,000 plus people. I don't know if you had a chance to catch the keynotes this morning, a lot of energy, a lot of, you know, cool stuff, great mm -hmm. music. You know, these tech shows are becoming like, you know, Las Vegas shows. Like a Broadway production, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Broadway production, you know, pretty amazing. But so what's your initial take of Pulse? Um, you know, the, I, I like Pulse because there's enough data protection in it that really keeps it interesting for me. And the fact that you can't go anywhere without talking about cloud um, is, is nothing but goodness. Um, it's a, it's a good show for us. So what's new in your data protection world? What have you been tracking lately? What are some of the things that have been exciting you? Maybe some of the challenges that you see companies finally stepping up to and address and some of the practitioners, same. Sure, so lately one of the things I've been really passionate around is helping people understand what I call the data protection spectrum. And what I mean by that is that data protection really ought to be thought of as kind of the umbrella term with things like backup and snapshots and replication and archive and availability, those are all like colors of a rainbow, right? And so what you ought to be thinking about when you're thinking about a data protection strategy is when was the last time you saw a rainbow that didn't have green or blue, right? In the same way your data protection strategy really ought to include backup plus snaps plus replication plus archive plus availability. It's that whole range of solutions that are there. Um, and I think also one of the things that people are, are starting to finally realize is that that kind of a hybrid approach, uh, those, those mechanisms for data protection, should also be thought of within the context of disk plus tape plus cloud. Um, uh, today's data protection really ought to have all options on the table and start thinking about how do you want to recover first and then pick the color of the rainbow, that spectrum line, um, that, uh, that makes the most sense for that. Yeah, so the basic premise there is you've got some some staples that you should have in your portfolio as a practitioner, red, green, and blue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know, it's interesting. I mean, there's always been a big spectrum of, of backup, right? And there's been guys who've said, it's all going to go disk-based. Yep. Um, guys at the other end of the spectrum, well, I, mean, they didn't, I mean, back in the day, right. right? I mean, you had guys like Storage Tech pushing tape into new dimensions and new applications. And, and, and you've just always had this you know, bevy of colors and flavors, been a, been a, been a, been quite a, a rich palette. Um, that's not changing. If anything, it's getting more diverse, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Um, you know, some of the things, so so we, we saw folks that said, you know, everything is going to go disk, it's not all going to go disk, right? So tape, um, tape is still in use in a little over half of all environments today, and in fact, some of the new innovations we see around tape durability and the flexibility of things like LTFS, I expect tape is actually going to get a little bit more bump on that. One of, the, uh, one of the pieces of research I recently looked at was around um, the convergence of backup and archive. And it used to be that people would say like, well, you know, backup was to disk and archive, that was to tape. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we don't see that as much anymore. In fact, um, a couple things I thought were really interesting. When we asked folks, um, what are you actually archiving? Right, that's one of the colors of the rainbow, right? So what are, what are you actually archiving? Um, I would have expected to hear people say like, well, I'm storing data for seven years, 10 years, 15 years. That's actually not true. So the average amount, of, the average age of data coming back out of the archive is under 24 months. The um, the average size of data coming back is typically a gig or less. 75% of the time, it's less than 100 gigs. And by the way, the expectation for how quick data should come out of the archive is typically measured now in seconds or minutes. When you start taking those kind of characteristics together, okay, so data under 24 months, um, small data sizes. Um, and really fast recovery and retrieval times, all of a sudden tape isn't really that obvious for that solution either. So all of a sudden disk and cloud also become just as viable for those kind of solutions. So the palette is really rich and the thing is is that um, it should not be around, well, if I'm doing this solution, I should use this media. There are no rules for that. Um, so really where, what, is, what is the domain of tape then? I mean, it's, there's certain economic advantages to tape if yep. you can find the right use case. I guess there's some bandwidth you know, advantages if you can find the right use case. What are those use cases? Is it deep archive? Is it retention? Is it mobility? So, so I like the deep archive, but frankly, today's um, uh, traditional data protection in the robo type environments, tape is still a more than adequate solution for some of those distributed environments as well, where for whatever reason they can't afford deduplicated disk. 
And, and, I, and the dedupe is actually a big part of that, right? So if you're just gonna go with disk-based backup and you're not du deduplicating, all of a sudden that gets really expensive. So, but for those environments that can't do that, tape is an interesting scenario there. I'll tell you frankly, um, so I have, a, I have an LTO5 uh, LTFS drive at home and it's my T drive, right? I copy files to and from it, I drag and drop and it literally is, it's T drive, which totally blows my mind, right? So, you know, 15 years ago, we wanted better backup than what tape could give us um, so we wanted to go to disk, but oh, by the way, we didn't know how to write to disk, so we made disk look like tape, and that's how we got VTLs, right? Now, fast forward 15 years, and tape actually has some new legs to stand on, but we don't know how to write to tape anymore, so now we put LTFS on it and make tape look like disk. Totally flips that equation around. So, you remember sort of the, the whole tape sucks, right? <laughs> and, uh, and that I, was, I've right, heard that rumor before. tape's around still. Um, I think the... Maybe the bumper sticker was should have been, you know, backup sucks, right? Which is great for, for guys like you because yeah. it means you. you know, it's, it's not like, solved yet. That's it's true. Like, it's not solved. It's it's all. I've been in this business a long time. Backup's always been one of the hardest problems to solve. Um, so tape, you're saying, still used in, in backup for small, mid-sized businesses yeah. and remote offices. Yep. And and what last resort DR or not necessarily you or know, anywhere else? Is that it? Is that the last domain of tape? I don't. I, I would. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to overly simplify and say that's the last domain because I think there's some other portability use cases mm -hmm. where tape has has legs on it too. Um, my point is just that that the same way that disk is not the be all end all silver bullet of data protection, tape is just as much not entirely dead. And oh by the way, cloud absolutely has a place. You know, one of the things that we were looking at, though, from a cloud perspective is there's a lot of folks out there that think that cloud is the silver bullet, right? It's the, as long as I write a check and just uh, all of a sudden all my backup problems go away. That is not true. Um, you know, there's a few cases where that happens to be, but really, for your backup problems to go away, it's not around cloud as a backup service. It's around the expertise and the consultancy coming in there to actually take over the management of it. But for most cloud-based data protection solutions, you're still going to run it. You're still going to have the admin. You're still going to be pushing the agents out. You're still going to be invoking the restores. You know, at that point, cloud-based data protection just becomes the mechanism by which you deploy it. Nothing else really changes. So, we were at reInvent. We had the cube there. And listening to Andy Jassy, he said that um, Glacier was the fastest-growing product in the history of AWS. Now, now, uh, Redshift was uh, uh, one of the other fast-growing products. I can't remember. One is revenue. One is capacity, but so anyway, fast growing product. They're all good. So they're all good, right. So Glacier, does, in your view, Glacier sort of confirm the need for a, a, a deep archive, low cost, not intense RTO type of, of, of medium? Right, yeah, so you know, if you think about the cloud, right, the cloud is just a deployment model that says that we believe that we can do things more efficiently because we're doing it at scale and we have deep expertise, right? I mean, in a nutshell, that's really what cloud means, right? And so if that's the case, and, and your, your use case is I need to store data for an extremely long period of time and I want to have a long shelf life on that, then that's a pretty good equation for tape. And so the difference just becomes instead of you managing your tape, they're managing their tapes instead, but the, the rest of the architecture kind of stays the same. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing I think people need to understand about cloud as, as far as what it comes to data protection. I'm going to take Glacier aside for a second, but in the more common sense of how data protection works, we looked at what the SLA expectations were of people that were going to the cloud, and by the way, the SLAs are about the same as people are doing on-premise protection, right? So just because you go to cloud does not absolve you of that rapid recovery, the expectation of fast um, protection, you know, all those other rules still apply. So because of that, we're seeing that really it's going to always be a disk to disk to cloud world for almost everybody. Now, there's a few exceptions to that where you get some really aggressive WAN acceleration, but for the most part, you're always going to have an on-premise intermediary appliance for fast recovery before you go to the cloud. Um, I did a podcast a couple weeks ago. And that's a, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, that's, yeah, go ahead. So that's a, that's a snapshot to a separate physical device. Well, it could be a snapshot, it could be a backup. And or a backup to a separate, but, but typically a separate physical device, or not yeah. necessarily, yeah. yeah okay. I, I think so it's for best be a separate practice, physical separate physical device, yep. just to cover your bases a little bit, and then get it off site as fast as you can. Exactly, so it's a disk to disk to cloud with an intermediary appliance there first. But here's the thing, I did a, I did a podcast a few weeks ago, and um, in that I talked about basically disk to disk to cloud is like having one box of Legos and three or four different instruction manuals. 
So I have sons, right? And so we, we grew up on Legos. And, and I am convinced that the box and that little bag of Legos, depending on which manual they stick in the box, you could turn into a motorcycle or a jet airplane, right? And disk to disk to cloud starts to look very similar to that because you could do a cloud-based data protection service, right? Which is where it's all driven from the cloud. And oh, by the way, they just put a caching appliance in there. You could just take your traditional on-premise backup that you do today, right? So your dedicated backup server, your dedicated backup appliance, whatever, and then just stretch it to the cloud. Either way, it's disk to disk to cloud. Really, it's just a matter of where does the management experience come from and what's the OpEx model. So what's IBM's play in all this? What, uh, what's, what's going on with IBM? What's going on at, 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 at Pulse? I mean, what's, where are they in this conversation? So I'm really excited about where they're going. Um, now, I'm a little blurry on, on, on what all was announced today versus what I happen to know in Roadmap. So, but I am really Yeah, so excited. we should stay away from that then. Right? Yeah, so we, we're not supposed to talk about that. Right, so. But, but here, here's the parts that I think are really interesting. So from a TSM investment perspective, I think 2013 was a year when IBM really said that, um, that you know, this is not your daddy's backup. Or arguably, in IBM's case, this is not your granddaddy's backup, right? I mean, they've been doing this for quite a while. Um, and they still got a big tape business. Absolutely, right? and they've got a disk solution, and they're coming into cloud really strong. I mean, so they've got all those right pieces. They also, by the way, I think a lot of people forget, they actually fill out that whole data protection spectrum, right? I mean, they have snapshotting, they have backup, they have archiving, they have replication technologies. Um, they do it across disk, tape, and cloud. And by the way, they do it across not just x86, but other platforms as well. I think a lot of people forget the breadth of that solution set. One of the things I'm probably most excited about for what we saw today was around um, Operation Center um, and that new UI. You know, you really want a proof point around this is not your daddy's IBM, it's the new UI. One of the things that, um, particularly for things like virtualization, so um, easily one of the most important workloads to protect right now is that highly virtualized software-defined data center, private cloud, yada, yada. Um, when we tested what are the problems that people have in that kind of environment, five of the top six problems in protecting virtualized environments are visibility, right? So, so I mean, you and I have been in this business a long time, right? So in the old days, you know, if you wanted to protect a, a server, you went over to the physical server, you put an agent on it, you could walk the copper across the room, you saw where the backup server was, and you were done, right? You could figure out what was going right or wrong. Today, if I want to figure out what's wrong with a VM backup, well, let's see, which cluster off of which host with which data store across which software-defined network, you know, virtualization is, the abstraction is powerful in a lot of things, but better data protection is not always one of them. It abstracts a lot of those details. And so some of the things that we saw around Operation Center where we're actually seeing, and these, these investments actually started in 2013 where um, they really made some investments around performance because they were behind. Right, um, and then um, some of the workload stuff around virtualization and the integration with VMware's uh, vCenter stack. All of a sudden, now they're in this. So, um, so it, uh, it ought to be an interesting 2014, particularly as they start to more aggressively put cloud into the mix. Now, how about mobile, Jason? You know, we've been hearing it at this conference at Pulse. A lot of talk about mobile. Mobile first. You know, everybody wants to bring their own devices. Internet of Things, even. Uh, what are you seeing on mobile? What are you seeing on just Endpoint backup. Fair enough. So, um, people, for, for some strange reason, there is a group of people out there that have figured out that because I bought the laptop, I'm supposed to be responsible for backing it up. And that's just foolish, right? The, the, the IT pro, they are the custodian of data, right? And whether that data lives on a corporate paid file server or whether it lives on a laptop I paid for myself, it is corporate data. Right? How can you try to absolve yourself of data protection for it just because it happens to be on a drive that you didn't pay for? So I think that's just flat dumb. Uh, and yet, it's really scary because when we actually did some research around this, we found that, that IT pros were having a very different strategy on whether to protect endpoint devices at all. Right? And the, the complaints there was, well, it's not strategic enough, and I'm concerned about storage sprawl, and I think it's going to be too much effort. It's corporate data. Right? That doesn't go away. But then for those posts that got past that and said, okay, yeah, you're right, I should probably protect it, they had different strategies for protecting the corporate owned devices than they did their BYOD devices, which is really pretty goofy if you think about it. I mean, it's corporate data. And if you take that one step further, recognize that demographically, the folks most likely to have a BYOD device as opposed to a corporately issued device is senior management. Right? You know, it's the folks at the top that said, I want that new spanky laptop of of, of 
product X, right? So if you're not protecting that data, not only are you selectively not protecting some of it, you're not protecting the executive's data, right? Can you imagine the CFO coming down to the IT pro and saying, I've lost my data, and the IT pro going, I'm sorry, that's not my problem, you bought the laptop, right? So, um, yeah, it's, what about it's this, a crazy um, world we live in. What about the challenge of copy creep, I call it, right? I mean, yeah. you, you've got zillions of copies, you're emailing stuff around, you've got you know, backs up, backup of backup, you've, you know, you got stuff on your mobile device, you got stuff up in Google Drive, you got stuff up in Evernote, maybe that's somebody else's problem because it's in the cloud. Uh, but, you know, if you look at the anatomy of a file, and then the number of times it gets copied. Oh yeah, 12, you know, 16, yeah, 20 iterations. Yeah, could, could even be more, right? Who knows? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I mean, yeah but, but definitely dozens, right? We can yep. agree on that. Um, what are you seeing in the marketplace? Uh, it's clearly a problem. You see some guys attacking it, like a Tipio, obviously, trying yep. to go after that problem. How you know real is that sort of approach, and and what are others doing? Yeah, so I, I, I like the Actifio approach. If for nothing else, then they've really driven a new story, right? The story of copy data management, and and, and it's kind of that ugly secret that so many folks um, in IT have just kind of ignored for so long, which is if I'm snapshotting and I'm backing up and I'm replicating and I'm archiving, all of a sudden I've got dozens of copies of this file. And, and all of the IT vendors that are in this space trying to solve this, they're trying to figure out, you know, I've got this really expensive data protection infrastructure out there, how do I shrink that footprint down um, uh, uh, so I can reduce my costs, right? Because otherwise I'm paying for this behemoth of infrastructure that has no value until the backup happens. So we're seeing a couple things out there. Um, we're seeing some interesting approaches around, uh, around reducing those copies, and that, a lot of that comes from converging that data protection spectrum. Just because you have five or six colors worth of data protection should not mean that you have five or six different storage silos, that you have five or six different management UIs, that you have five or six different um, uh, data protection strategies. We should be seeing convergence there, and the more you converge the back end storage, that's goodness, right? Because at least that's reducing your major capex. But then we're also seeing on what can those vendors do to actually make that data more useful? Can I represent it so that, uh, so for um, test dev, or for running reports, or for end user access enablement? So there's a lot of interesting momentum right now on how do I make the value of that infrastructure better by providing more agility and more solutions than just if something goes bad, I have the ability to recover it. So Jason, last question. Um, you got this spectrum, this rainbow. Yep. Uh, IT pros, uh, got to deal with this stuff. You know, backup is always like the insurance. It's not the the high priority, high ROI project. It's one of those. If it's something you know goes bad, then I'm screwed. So sure. So that's the snake bitten you know ROI. What's your advice for IT pros that are struggling with the spectrum? You know, they got virtualization visibility issues. They're they're interested in the cloud, but they're afraid of it. Yep. Um, you know, they're hanging on to some tape, and maybe for good reason, but they're getting pressure to get rid of the tape. Yep. Um, they're worried about, you know, dedupe appliances, you know, getting out of control and being too expensive. They got others telling them, just use snapshots and create data protection as a service. What's your best advice to IT pros that are confused? Yeah. Um, so I guess the best advice I would, I would say is, is that the data protection spectrum does not have to be a complicated set of autonomous components. Um, there's a lot of great software solutions out there that do let you do replication plus snapshot management plus backup in a single UI to a single data store um, with a, with, from a single administrator's point of view. Um, the problem is a lot of people actually don't wake that up. The, uh, the storage guy wants to do his own backups and the compliance guy wants to do his own archives. And if they just woke up and realized that we have a software solution with a single UI that all three of them could use to a storage silo they can all three benefit from, all of a sudden, it doesn't have to be that hard. I would also say that, um, that, that every solution should be considering the cloud as part of it, just not pure cloud. It should always go first to disk on-premise and then go to the cloud as that tertiary tier. And when you start to do that, all of a sudden, new options start to come in back. And in fact, when, when ESG looked at what was going to be the primary use cases of cloud for the next couple years, data protection was the number one sided planned use case, and disaster recovery was number three. Test dev was number two. So it's not the production workloads, it's the other stuff that you know you need to do, and cloud gives them a new way to do it cheaper. So I said last question, but I, I, I have another one. <laughs> Data protection as a service. Reality in the next year or so, or is it going to take longer? So I like data protection as a service. Um, the one thing I would tell you is, why Baz when you can Draz? 
Um, what do you mean by that? So, so backup as a service just means the files go to that, to that other site, right? Draz is where I'm taking whole VMs and I'm moving those VMs into the cloud, and then if I need to recover, I can spin those VMs up, right? DR as a service. And, and interestingly enough, most of the plumbing that makes DR as a service happen, most of that plumbing is actually built on backup as a service functionality. So um, you get all the benefits of backup as a service and you get DR to a secondary yeah, location. So it really is taking, uh, uh, transcending backup as a service into data protection overall. Strategies. Exactly. Great. Uh, uh, any, let's see, blogs that we, people should go to? Where do they get yeah. more information? Um, so uh, follow me on Twitter, jbuff, J-B-U-F-F. -F. Um, and my primary blog is technicaloptimist.com. All right, Jason Buffington from ESG. Thanks very much, always a great guest. Really appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody, keep it right there. Be back with John Furrier right after this. We're live from the MGM in Las Vegas. This is Pulse, this is theCUBE.